Good afternoon, uh, dear Anda Jamnitski, um, dear family on the first row, uh, friends, colleagues, professors from Maastricht and uh, the other universities, dear audience here in the room and on the live stream, a warm welcome to this academic event. My name is Ralf Peters, uh, I'm Vice Dean of the Faculty of Science and Engineering and uh, I will be acting today as the Pro-Rector, which means that I represent uh, the Rector of this University, that's uh, Pamela Habibovic. Uh, she could not be present here today, but uh, she's sending you her congratulations and uh, the same also for the Dean of our Faculty, uh, Professor Thomas Klein. And before I give the floor to uh, Anna, it's my pleasure to share a few details about her and her chair and her research. Uh, Anda uh, came to Maastricht in 2021, if I'm correct, um, to take up this new chair on computational social science at our Faculty of Science and Engineering. And before, she worked uh, already as a full professor at the University of South Florida in uh, Tampa, where she was employed for, I think, 15 years. And uh, even before that, she studied in her home country, Romania, and then uh, she did a second master's and a PhD in Chicago. Uh, so she's seen quite a bit of the world. And uh, uh, so, yes, obviously, we are very happy to have her here um, uh, on board of this faculty, such an experienced uh, colleague. Um, and we are a young and ambitious faculty, so we can need some people with, uh, with good experience. Um, you will obviously understand that she has an impressive CV and a track record with lots of impactful research, uh, funding, uh, honors, awards, multiple of those. And I'm not going to bother you with that. You can read that on, on the internet and, um, and look it up and maybe you've already done so. Um, but these are usually the, uh, the, the less interesting details of, of this occasion. Um, let me tell you a bit about Anda's chair. It is embedded in uh, the Institute of uh, Data Science, which is now part of the D Department of Advanced uh, Computing Sciences. And one key role of this chair is to foster collaboration between uh, the Faculty of Science and Engineering and the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Um, and another one is to link to parties in, um, uh, yeah, outside of the university and in society. Um, and uh, social media platforms and uh, their related networks, they have become widespread and uh, tremendously influential in, I would say, just about a decade or, uh, or maybe two decades. Um, and nowadays they affect many of the key processes in society, uh, including business, politics and elections, um, and also the way that we interact with uh, each other. So. We think uh, as a faculty that it is of key importance for our future society that we understand better how they work and uh, how we best deal with them in a responsible way. Now, this topic fits uh, excellently with the ambitions of our Faculty of Science and Engineering. Uh, we are a young faculty, which we started only six years ago, and um, we aim to carry out uh, high quality research, obviously, and teaching in uh, modern areas, because we are young, we can also set some of the agenda. And we've chosen as a faculty to choose for critically relevant uh, areas for what we think uh, will be important in the near future. So think of topics like circularity and sustainability, but very much also about data science, uh, AI and robotics. Um, also about new ways of working like team science um, or citizen science even. And uh, we are confident that Anda is very well equipped to uh, contribute to this. And in fact, we have already experienced this somewhat um, in, the, in the past two, two and a half years. Now, as Anda and I are work, working in the same department, uh, I've had the pleasure to, of getting to know her a bit uh, already over the last two to three years. And she has already acted uh, as the... Uh, temporary director of IDS, uh, when, when uh, Michelle, her colleague, was on sabbatical for a year. Um, and I'd like to characterize her as someone with, uh, certainly with humor and aiming for quality at the same time, by being critical in a positive way, uh, being community-minded, uh, and visibly contributing to an inclusive environment at the department and at the faculty. Uh, people tell me that she actively works to increase the number of female staff in the department and uh, will not miss any opportunities to have this on the agenda. 
And I've also heard through the grapevine that she likes to comment on the Dutch and the peculiarities and the strange ways and habits. And I'd love to hear more about it. Uh, but maybe we should reserve such discussions for the gossiping at the reception afterwards. So I guess it's time to announce the title of today's inauguration, uh, Cheats and Gossips in, uh, social, uh, in Cybersocial Processes. And I hope you're all on the edge of your seats and will enjoy this Friday afternoon. Anna Jamnitski, the floor is yours. Thank you, Prorector Peters, for the introduction. I'll try to uh, live up to the expectations and be critical. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's a real honor that you chose to spend a Friday afternoon with me. Um, I will uh, uh, talk about work, in, indeed, on cheats and gossips. Uh, but first, I would like to thank the audience online, uh, family and friends, and other friends who are here and I just uh, see, uh, and colleagues and so on. So thank you for uh, joining me for this event. There is a problem from the 1735 that is um, claimed to be the beginning of a field of science now. And this is, called, uh, the, is known as the Bridges of Königsberg. And the story goes that uh, the mathematician Euler was given this following story, um, problem to solve. In the city of Königsberg, where, which was in Prussia, uh, there was a river, and the river split the city in multiple pieces, including having an island in the middle of the river, or separated by the river. And the pieces of the city were um, connected by bridges, seven bridges. And Euler was asked if he can find a path, a continuous path, that would go over all the bridges, but only once. Okay? What Euler re realized soon was that it didn't matter where within a land, a, a mass of land, the, the path would take him. What mattered was how he would connect from one uh, mass of land to another. So he came up with the following abstraction that we now know it's a, it's a graph in which every mass of land was a node and the nodes you see them in capital letters A, B, C, D which are yeah, the pieces of land surrounded by water and the bridges would be the edges that would connect these masses of land. And this abstraction uh, that we now call graphs or networks uh, are therefore made of nodes and edges, and they simplify somehow the problem. I would like to solve the problem over during uh, the reception, um, but basically this is credited as the beginning of a field that was initially called, known as graph theory, and now it's more and more called network science. There are differences between them. But in the 20th century, there was an active period of research in silos of uh, of, of disciplines, basically. In uh, a branch of mathematics that was called graph uh, theory, uh, people were concerned with problems such as how do I define a random type of this structure that is a graph, and what are the properties of such a graph? In computer science, or what was becoming computer science, uh, people were concerned about creating algorithms with provable properties that would traverse such graphs. And the big name in this area is the Dutch uh, computer scientist Dijkstra. In sociology, behavioral sciences, economics, uh, people defined problems, again, using graphs. Uh, and they concerned with uh, properties of social networks, such as particular uh, groupings of three nodes that were very rare. The, those are the forbidden triads or what is the influence in a network, or how companies might uh, decide not to cooperate with each other such that they gain advantages on the market. However, in the early 2000s, there was an explosion in the study of networks. Um, one motivation could be the internet and the growth of the internet as a global uh, network now. Network being uh, a different uh, terminology is the communication network. Um, and people started asking other questions on the applications that were developed on top of the communication infrastructure that we know as internet. Just two examples in, uh, in this case. One is 
the question, how does the web graph look like? Where the web graph is defined as pages, as nodes, and the links between pages, which are the, what we click on to connect from one page to another, being the edges of this uh, network. And it matters because, or it mattered because um, search engines were based on crawling, you know, uh, parsing, going from one uh, page to another, following the, the links. So it matters if it mattered if this uh, network was connected or disconnected. So the question was, can you really have all the information from the web by following the links, the, the HTML links? Another example from the time was related to what was called peer-to-peer -peer applications. That's way before iTunes, Spotify, and such, when people wanted to share music with each other. And the way they did it uh, was by connected in a, connecting in a distributed fashion, decentralized fashion, self-organizing, uh, such that they could share music and make it available for others and, of course, get music from others. Uh, it died off. Copyright issues were a big deal, and uh, the law, the legal, uh, the legal uh, industry came in. Um, but there were properties of these applications that were very interesting to study. So questions were like, what is the topology of these decentralized networks, and how, especially, how does that topology affect how reliable or resilient to failures? Uh, such topologies are. So one uh, important result was that if you attacked the 3% of the most connected nodes in this network, you could disconnect the network. You could render it ineffective, basically. But if you randomly target 30% of the nodes without any um, regard to how well connected they were, then you would still have a well-functioning smaller network, but connected. So this type of research found me at uh, University of Chicago, where I was a PhD student, and that is the department where I, uh, that was computer science department back then, now they have a fancier building. Um, and I was impressed uh, and interested in these um, studies of networks and topological uh, structures, and trying to understand how those structures affect the uh, performance of the applications on top. So what I will be talking today will be cheats and gossips um, online, but from a perspe the perspective of networks. Cheats. Why bother to study cheats? I'm, and I'm, I'm using cheats as a very loose term. So it's, it's rule bending. And the internet makes us believe that we're anonymous. Uh, so the rule bending is very common. Why study cheating, per se? Be first, because it's a hidden activity. Uh, it's not, I mean, it's rare the case where you hear somebody declaring that they don't pay taxes, for example. Um, but the objective is really to contain harm because cheating, uh, which is bending rules in a society, may lead to damage to other members of the society. So the question is, can we measure such phenomena and can we then build a mechanism to contain the harm? or even to, and to detect maybe the cheaters. Um, and I studied this um, research at the initiative of uh, back then PhD student, Jeremy Blackburn, who now is an accomplished researcher and an expert in what he calls understanding jerks online. Um, and uh, the, um, his uh, interest as a avid gamer was in um, figuring out how the cheating behavior spreads in the social networks of gamers. So we started, we started with this um, question. Um, can we see what is the position of the cheaters in a social network of gamers? So what we did, we collected uh, data from a platform that is called Steam. Uh, it's run by a company called Valve. And it's, I was told, a type of uh, Amazon for games. Basically, you buy your uh, um, games from there and you play your games. Uh, back then, it was also a social network on top of this platform that was called Steam Community. And people who were uh, joining the Steam Community would declare their friends in the community. So you would have a social network of declared relationships between users. The nodes in this case are uh, user accounts of Steam, and the edges are friendship, the declared friendship relationships between the users of this um, community. 
um, it was important to look at this problem because the, cheat, the gaming industry is huge and it's huge now. It was huge 10 years ago when this study was done. Um, and uh, it grew significantly during the, the COVID times. Now, what happens when you have a successful uh, industry is there is a counter industry that tries to get some money. And the counter industry is that of cheat creation. So the, the, the industry is in selling cheats that would enable the gamers to gain unfair advantage in their play. Uh, a cheat would be a piece of software often uh, offered as a subscription, such that you would get updates of the latest and uh, um, more um, detection avoidance characteristics. Uh, <clears throat> and the cheat industry was a, a real danger to the business of the gaming. Therefore, there was the gaming industry had a big um, motivation to find cheaters and to stop basically um, stop them, the, stop the cheats from uh, propagating. Now, what we one example of cheats. So, a cheat is just a piece of software that you can download and run on your computer while you you play, uh, and uh, enables you to have superhuman powers. In this example, you can see, I think, a little uh, silhouette somewhere there. This is not supposed to be seen. This is seeing through walls. So it's the cheat enables the, the gamer to see through walls, and which of course allows you uh, the gamer to aim uh, properly when the, the the other player gets off the wall. Um, so how easy it is to get these cheats? Apparently easy. Why would you get them? Sometimes because it's fun, and studies show that even in single player games, people cheat. Uh, so our question was, how does cheating spread in games? We collected 10 million user profiles. Um, and these user profiles, in addition to the uh, social network information that I told you uh, it contained, it also contained uh, another piece of information, which was a mark of having caught cheating. And that mark was red, was permanent. You never clear it off of your profile. And it was visible no matter what the setting of the profile was. Even if you had the profile put on uh, private, everything was private except the cheating mark. So of course, this was very nice information for us because it was somebody else who decided that that has been a cheater and the, it was a company who was running Steam. And uh, we could get this um, very good uh, information. Now, what did we do with this um, data? So first we had uh, um, 10 million accounts and then we tried to see various uh, um, statistics just to understand what we had. Basically we had a worldwide population of players. On average, 7% of the players were cheaters and the distribution of cheaters in various countries was varying. Um, we thought of uh, in Florida, during the you know never ending sun, we were thinking that it's the dark winters that make people in Northern Europe cheat uh, more than the rest. Um, it turned out later in a talk I was giving in a psychology department that, uh, in fact, there had been a marketing, um, strong marketing uh, campaign of a particular game in Northern European countries, and that particular game had a lot of cheats in it. So having been adopted by more players, there were more cheaters playing the game. But what, interest, what became interesting was when we looked at the network characteristics of the, the social network and uh, especially at the position of cheaters in the social network. Because we, qu we quickly noticed that the more cheater friends a player had in the declared social network, the more likely was that that uh, account was also marked as a cheater. So you had, for example, about 70% of the players who, never, who didn't have a cheater friend, not on one, and they were green, they were the safe ones. While the more red nodes around somebody, the more likely was that that uh, uh, account was also marked as cheater. 
So we try to understand what happens, how is it possible? Because cheating is not a badge of honor. It comes with some um, penalties, such as you couldn't play on particular game, uh, servers. You wouldn't lose the rights to play, um, or you wouldn't lose the game itself, but it wouldn't be necessarily a good thing that would inspire you to do that. So what we did, uh, and this was a huge effort at that time, was uh, we collected data over and over again, over a period of a month, to see how the cheating flag is injected, let's say, in the network. And why was that? Is because we didn't have the timing information of when a cheat would be applied to an account, and Valve was also trying to delay the application of the cheating mark in order to not give away information to the cheat industry, which cheats failed, basically. So then we had to overcome this lack of information by doing a lot of crawling over and over again of the same accounts to see when they will turn red. There is no turning green from red. So, so what you see in this um, picture is snapshots at five days intervals. So it's a month uh, in all of how a community of accounts evolves from mostly non-cheaters to mostly cheaters at the end in the, the bottom right um, picture. And this is what gave us the idea that cheating is a social adoption process. The more cheaters you have in your uh, environment, the, be the easier it comes for you to cheat because cheating becomes more acceptable due to the social enforcement. This result was in fact independently uh, known, let's say, for example, in educational settings. If you don't punish cheaters that you catch in your classes, you get more cheaters in your classes. So this is just for us. But that was a very nice, clean type of problem, looking at the data in this way. Why? Because we had clear, reliable uh, labels of what che a cheater, who is a cheater. Uh, we believe that those who are not marked cheaters are, for the time being, non-cheaters. So it was a, a nice way of identifying the process and measuring and understanding what's going on. Since then, in the last 10 years or so, things changed significantly uh, online. There are very many other types of cheats that perhaps are more um, worrying than you know, cheating in a particular community that might not affect the rest of the population. Uh, one of the significant problems online is the online disinformation. And this year is the year of elections where we have more than half of the population of the globe living in a country that is uh, having elections or had elections before, uh, during the year. So, and there is a lot of concern about this because um, there have been seen not only in the 2016 elections in the States and uh, Brexit, but there have been instances in which in, in, uh, inst investigative journalists discovered um, misinformation, disinformation campaigns meddling into uh, elections in various countries. And also because there is a big danger now of using generative AI as a low cost, low cost uh, producer of misleading content, right? If uh, before you had to hire people to write nonsense, now you just give the job to ChatGPT and you get nonsense quickly and convincing no nonsense. So given these concerns, um, what can we do? One example that is well known in the community about one such information campaign is the one against the white helmets. Um, who knows white helmets? Who knows who white helmets are? You've been to my talks before. Uh, the white helmets are a Syrian volunteer organization uh, known for humanitarian actions. They were active during the height of the Syrian civil war. Uh, for uh, their efforts to rescue civilians. Uh, they also refused to align with any grouping or military faction uh, during the war. They are known or called by their white helmets, that's part of the gear. On the white helmets, they also have cameras that stream or record uh, their missions. And this video footage became a threat to the Syrian regime. 
because of this threat, uh, they were basically the target of a disinformation campaign with the objective of um, s picturing them as terrorists uh, and basically dis discouraging the West to send money to the white helmets for their equipment and uh, gear that were, was meant to sa uh, save the um, civilian population. Now, this campaign was again uh, known or discovered by investigative journalists. They are the ones who first uh, and see something happening and then publish an article and they have the uh, time to look into one particular problem. Uh, and then once it was known, it was taken over by scientists and data scientists and scientists of uh, qu quantitative and qualitative methods to really uh, understand what were the methods used in this disinformation campaign. So some of the methods that we know um, is that they, um, the anti-white helmets voices were droning the social media. They were much more popular or many more vo such voices than the ones who would uh, say positive things about the white helmets. Uh, the alternative media and government funded uh, media played a key role in this campaign and YouTube was at the center uh, of this campaign. So then as part of a DARPA funded project in uh, the United States where uh, we were basically tasked to understand how information spreads, we got access to a very rich data set this data set was composed of YouTube videos that were collected based on keywords that contain white helmets in different languages. So no stance there, no, uh, no interpretation of what's right or wrong. We're just looking at what videos have in their title or description the words white helmets in various languages. You see the... the the languages we used for collection in, uh, in that um, box. Uh, then we, from this collection, we had 600 some YouTube videos that supposedly were talking about the white helmets. In addition to this, we had a Twitter data set that had tweets that included URLs to these YouTube videos, right? So again, no stance, it's only whoever posted information that included the URL to these videos, we would have uh, that in our collection. Independently, we collected the same about Facebook from the same period of time, from 2018 to 2019. Uh, again, only posts, as in Twitter, only tweets, no retweets, uh, and in uh, Facebook, only uh, posts that would include a uh, YouTube video. And look now, okay. Um, so with this data set, I can talk. Look, I can talk without slides, but I can't understand it. It's all pictures. <laughs> I think it's the Russian media. <laughs> they saw the slide I'm putting up now, and it has a lot of Russia today and Sputnik. I see it all. I see it nicely. <laughs> now, now it's your turn to say some jokes because I'm a bit... Uh... <laughs> okay, the bridge is coming. All right, there is not hope. Was this part of the plan? Prorector Peters, can I ask if this is how you test your new professors? This should be a PhD defense, Thales, careful. <laughs> I'll have to rush through then. I'll skip the part. Would be nice if I know that there is something. Jokes, people. <laughs> I 
that is true. And this is streaming. Look, hello. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I don't know either. Let's try this. Oh, yeah. Do it again. I could have done that. I have a PhD in computer science. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're back. So what we discovered, we remember what we had? We had social media data from three platforms, YouTube, tw Twitter, and Facebook. And now we're processing this data and trying to understand what we can see from network patterns. And what we see, the red uh, dots, the red nodes, are YouTube channels. And the uh, smaller nodes connected to the, to the red nodes are uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts. And are only those accounts that within 52 seconds of each other published the very same video from that particular channel. So it's not a popularity um, or a, a popularity uh, picture here. It's only those accounts who happened to, synchron to synchronize within 52 seconds of each other to publish the same YouTube, uh, link to YouTube video to the same YouTube video, okay? So what do you see, and this is uh, where uh, we'll, we'll be cut again. Uh, these are the media, the um, mainstream news channel. You see um, BBC uh, here with only two accounts who happen to push information within 52 seconds. Uh, you see CNN, I believe, and this is CBS News. And you also see that they are disconnected from the rest of the network, okay? And with rather few nodes uh, who synchronized in this um, peculiar way. And then you see Russia Today in, in the middle with a lot of user accounts who, again, happen to push the very same video within 52 seconds from each other. Uh, and you see uh, other channels of Russia today, which are the German, the American, and the British, I think. Uh, and then this is Sputnik, which is another uh, state-sponsored Russian news media. And uh, another part of this network, and also connected well with this core of Russian uh, news channels, are uh, this well-known conspiracy theory um, YouTube channels. Some of them have been um, blocked since we did the study. They are not available. You can't see them anymore. So what does this show? It shows that if we make this magic uh, constraint of 52 seconds, which is not so magic. In fact, it's based on a heuristic proposed in a different paper. Um, we can see these bizarre patterns, but there is, this is not a proof, right? This is just a way to see suspicious activity that it's coordinated in time and content. And it's not perfect. Why is it not perfect? Because we made very strong assumptions. Uh, for example, we assumed that exactly the same URL will be pushed by multiple users. In fact, if you look at uh, the content of uh, the um, YouTube videos, you see that many of these YouTube videos have very much, are very much the same. Basically, they have significant overlapping content. They take the same video footage and then repackaging and push it into a different channels as a different video with a different URL. So by using the constraint of the very same URL, we, used, we lo lost a lot of information. Uh, another... Um, way of being too constrained in our uh, approach was um, we only looked at the um, links. But sometimes even if it's not the same link in a post, for example, you have the very same message as in this uh, case. And of course, the time matters. And if we can relax the 52 seconds, we might be able to see more, um, more of this uh, unusual synchronization. So then we pose the next uh, the, um, question together with uh, Jerry Spanakis of DAX. Can we develop multimodal techniques? Well, by multimodal for the non-computer scientists, it really means different types of information. It can be video and text and other information, time, for example. Uh, can we use this multimodal uh, information such that we can identify groups of 
that are uh, engaged in a coordinated information campaign. And what professors do when they don't know the answer to a question, they pass it to a student. So what we did in this case, we passed it to a group of uh, four uh, students who were taking poor guys, the master of uh, the MS uh, project. Um, and they delivered. They uh, came up with a technique that would take this multimodal information, will uh, process it in some way, but in a much more relaxed way than our constrained uh, graph, and will do an uh, will run an unsupervised clustering algorithm on top of this information, and will detect clusters of messages where those messages were promoting channels of very similar factuality score. By factuality score, I mean it's uh, information from um, third parties, which is a website, for example, Media Bias Fact Check, uh, where journalists are rating the channels based on the factuality of the information they promote. And what they discovered is that, yes, they can cluster this uh, information and the clusters will be very close, uh, the, the elements in the cluster will be very close in pushing the same quality of information, let's say. This was published in a uh, uh, conference last uh, year and we see Carlos there starting his talk on the work. Now the next step for us would be, and what is the ground truth? Can we check if indeed what these clusters did uh, was indeed the, the cheating uh, messages? And the problem is we do not know because there is no proof. Unlike in STEAM community, we do not have the cheaters, marked as cheaters, uh, clearly marked as cheaters. Another thing we could do for, uh, for good science, we would say, fine, let's take our technique and put it on a different data set and see how well it works. And guess what? We do not have a different data set. There are very few data sets that look at multi-platform coordination, and it only has to be after they discover that there was a coordinated campaign, disinformation manipulation campaign. So with this uh, problem, then, we're back to square one. Are we in this uh, never-ending loop in which we fight the next tool? In this case, is generative AI. No, uh, we can use the tool for our benefit, right? So this was the next question. Can ChatGPT create social media data sets that would help us in testing our own solutions and creating better solutions and gaining trust in what we develop? And guess what? We didn't have the answer to this, therefore we passed it to students. In this case, a UCM team uh, Lily is here, uh, Lily and Sander, who took the four-week uh, data science project and they delivered. They said, yes, we can make, um, we can have ChatGPT create believable posts for social media. But they started with a much smaller problem, only one platform, Instagram, and not as loaded as political disinformation. Instead, we looked at a different uh, type of cheat, which is that of non-disclosed sponsored content. So the question in this case uh, is, uh, so the, the legally, and I ha we have legal scholars in here, so I won't look at them such that I don't uh, see nods or, uh, um, but the uh, problem is that uh, legally, if you have sponsored content, you should mark it as sponsored content. And this should be both in uh, television, for example, and online. However, online doesn't happen. Why? Because we believe we're anonymous or we believe it's way too much information to make uh, this happen. So, and Instagram is one such platform where monetization of content is huge and there are people who are making lots of money out of sponsorship. Uh, what they do, they uh, put their own, um, they, they place or they describe their amazing, I don't know, hair products uh, without necessarily disclosing that that is part of a sponsored campaign. So our question was, can we have ChatGPT create such posts? Meet the Instagram influencer ChatGPT. These are Instagram posts created by ChatGPT. And if you get to read, you see that it's chic and hydrated, it's um, fashionable, 
and it has a beautiful hair color. What the ingredients of this uh, Instagram posts are, are very believable. It makes up um, hashtags that are coherent with the, the, the text. It makes up URLs that again are believable. So hair by Lisa Salon.com doesn't exist. I checked it this morning. Um, and then it also tags users who do not exist. So it knows to go through the motions, which for this particular um, objective is perfect. Exactly it's what we need, right? We don't need uh, references to real people or references to real um, businesses or uh, URLs. So did we solve the problem? The problem being of quality data that would enable us to fight the cheats. Um, only superficially, because if you look deeper and if you look again through a network's perspective, you discover that uh, it's not believable. What ChatGPT is not able to do is to make connections between the, the posts that it makes. So if you look at the data set, the collection of the posts it creates, you see that it's uh, disconnecting things. Uh, and this is uh, two examples of networks again, where you have the real data on the top, uh, and uh, nodes are hashtags and edges are uh, co-appearance of hashtags in the same post. Uh, it's much more connected than the synthetic data set on the bottom. We also notice that uh, it's much less diversity in what ChatGPT produces. Uh, all posts have about the same length or there is less variation than um, but the skin tones are mostly yellow and light colored. You don't have dark colored skin tones for the emojis uh, and all sorts of other peculiarities that would give away that this is a synthetic data set and not real. So I told you a lot about cheats um, and I didn't tell you much about gossips. But the gossips are, in fact, by gossip, I really mean, mean the spread of information, but nobody would show up for information diffusion in online environments talks on Friday afternoon. Um, oh. One will do. Um, uh, so the gossips, in this case, uh, basically all this research I presented came from um, the question of how does information spread? And sometimes it's just information. Sometimes it's adoption of behavior. How does behavior spread? Uh, in, a, in a society. And um, the, I, I want to finish on a good news tone. Um, we did another study in which we looked at polarized environments because polarization is a big uh, problem. The fact that people don't reach, don't agree on the same truth, uh, that is a, a, a big threat to democracy. And we took again the uh, data set from Twitter, the same white helmets data set, but only tweets this time, and trying to see who are the pro tweets, uh, the pro white helmets uh, accounts, and who are the anti white helmets accounts based on who they retweet. Yeah? So we have that network uh, in the picture where the red, the many nodes, are uh, the anti white helmets. Uh, account speaking, and the green ones are the pro-white helmets. What you see, it's very little interaction between them. The network is connected, but barely so. It's a very thin neck uh, in between. And we asked, okay, if we're trying, if we have a number of uh, users in one of these communities trying to convince everybody of some behavior, will they manage? And the um, short answer is no, they will fail. And this is due to the polarization of the community. And we did this um, quantitatively based on simulations, but it is also what appears in the, um, the Economist article that says, let's not quite panic as much about AI because it's a polarization of the society that will not allow all the stories that AI makes to be believed by the other side. So there are advantages that we can take or we can choose to take from uh, what's happening now. So what is the message that perhaps you remember after drinks at the reception? Um, the networks tell stories and you can use them to just have 
an intuition of what's happening and then you can go deeper in with different methods sometimes can be qualitative or quantitative to really see if what the intuition uh, if the intuition provided is indeed true so let me tell you the story of my in this case collaboration network the question that my husband asked was what is that moon that's crashing into the land alex do you know it's a paper that came out of the Dagstuhl seminar. So it was a, a one week intense uh, seminar that uh, uh, created that blob of co-authors. This is my co-authorship network. I'm, apologies for that in the middle. And then everybody is connected um, by a paper co-authored with me over the time. And that uh, moon crashing into the earth uh, is um, that co-authorship network. But it's more important to perhaps zoom in, and I'm doing this because I cited a lot of work done with uh, other people, and I want to give them credit. Uh, what you see here are um, my co-authors uh, with more than one, so I removed the moon, with more than one papers uh, in common. So these are the persistent uh, co-authorship relationships, and what you can see is the gown of University of Chicago, similar to this one, so I feel like I'm coming home. Um, but that is the small network of co-authors uh, built during my PhD. Uh, this is the big network of co-authors that includes many of my former PhD students and uh, of uh, whose work I uh, mentioned from University of South Florida. And this is my incipient network that is growing now mighty from uh, Maastricht University. And then there is the non-quantifiable network, and this is what I so in other inaugural speeches, but my voice cracks of emotion if I say anything about family and friends, so thank you. I will only acknowledge my husband who has uh, proofread an insane uh, number of scientific manuscripts that's, that's dangerous for a professor of the arts. <laughs> and I want to thank you for being here. It's been really an honor. Dixit. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, uh, Anda, for this very interesting and, uh, and also inspiring presentation. Um, and thank you for sharing your insights into these modern uh, social networks. Uh, I think you gave us uh, quite a lot of food for thought. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to use the reception to see if we can actually exercise some responsible gossiping there and uh, discuss the, the network she showed us. Um, on behalf of Maastricht University, I'm wishing you the best of luck with your chair and uh, for many years to come. Um, and we are really proud to have you on board with us. I would like to thank everybody for joining us here today, uh, both on the live stream and here in this room. So let me conclude by inviting you to this reception and uh, close the academic ceremony. Thank you.